Today an interview on grouping approaches. The concept of grouping is appealing for both authorities and industry. But in the implementation there might be a snack. What is the price we pay for this? Something that reminded me of the Pied Piper story. And COVID inspired, we replaced the rats in the story with groups of bats in their cartoon. Where and in which situation should the Pied Piper lead these groups? Or in our chemical universe, what are the considerations for grouping approaches? Something I look forward to discussing with Clarine Wagenmaker-Sieker from Altana and Paul Ryan from the European Chemicals Agency. Clarine, can you explain why grouping is an effective chemicals management tool for industry? Grouping of substances can be a very useful tool for chemical risk assessment and um, it is used in different ways today. So we used grouping for um, filling the data gaps in our REACH dossiers um, and avoiding animal testing and also be more efficient. And nowadays a grouping is also used more for the risk assessment and grouping of substances based on hazards. And we see that both sides are very good and help to be more efficient and effective. And, but we also f see the need that we need uh, a transparent and current way to do the grouping. And I think this is very important in which way we uh, perform grouping that we are very clear and transparent on that. So that's something you like guidance on perhaps? Uh, yes, I think guidance is very important and even uh, more st stringent guidance because the better you know um, how grouping is uh, accepted because we all know that there are quite some compliance checks uh, have been made in the past and also grouping was not accepted and we see that it's very important to have a clear guidance to be effective with our grouping. Okay, is a guidance something ECHA is working on? Well, we have existing guidance, the Red Cross Assessment Framework which is one which is meant to, to guide in a way. Um, I think we're learning by doing a, a, lot of, a lot of what we're doing now because we're looking at grouping more than ever as well. So I think maybe not, no guidance is planned per se on top of what we have already, but there's maybe opportunities to learn from experience. Okay, uh, Clarine, Paul already mentioned Read Across. Eh? Industry has of course enjoyed the Read Across resort for many years. How realistic were these Read Across assumptions since often additional testing is required by ECHA? Yes, we have uh, done Read Across and also in other regulatory regimes it's accepted, but as said before there is no clear guidance. So a lot of Read Across was done based on the existing knowledge. And um, just especially for the more complex substances, the UVCBs, this is um, more difficult. Just recently the guidance came out, 2022, for this. And we also saw, of course, the um, guidance of the risk assessment fundamentals, which is very helpful, useful, 2015, 2017, updated. So these are really good things. And looking back, of course, we have to look at the REACH dossiers and apply those guidances and look at our read across done. Okay. Hey Paul, in 2017 the Read Across Assessment Framework was introduced aiming to improve the regulatory consideration of the Read Across cases. Did this achieve what ECHA aimed for? I think it did. I mean, the aim was to provide some structure to Read Across. So it's a framework and it guides a registrant in how to look at some things in a 360 manner. So what, what not to forget when you're doing a Read Across. So, and I think it's delivered on that. We've seen that when people apply it in registration dossiers, it's more clear in what they're, they're trying to do. And equally from our side, it's clear when we assess against it, why we might disagree. But having said that, what I'd like to maybe add is that it's not a magic bullet. So there's obviously the strength of every read across will be the underlying data or the arguments made in the read across, which is the key element in, in every case by case read across. But the framework is a framework or a structure for that. Yeah, so there's not a technical completeness check for read across. No, we, we haven't invented that one yet. Ah, maybe some suggestions later. <laughs> um, Paul, in ECAS Chemicals Universe, we can observe progressively more from a substance by substance approach to addressing groups of structural similar substances for other purposes, so like the restriction measures. Mm -hmm. How is grouping used today and what other uses of grouping approaches are considered? Quite extensively we've been using grouping for the, for the past few years now in our screening approach. So we plan and try to speed up our work with grouping. So we look at groups of chemicals and we try to put them on a path. First question to ask is, is often do we think these maybe need risk management based on the data that we have or do we think they could be put aside because it looks like we don't need imminent um, measures on them. 
So that's the gist of our grouping work at the moment that we're doing quite heavily. Uh, if we have enough data to suggest that there's a hazard there, maybe we need to confirm it in a compliance check or in some other process. And after that, maybe we can move on to risk management, like classification and labeling for a group or restrictions, as you mentioned. Similarly, if, like I said earlier, if, if we think it's, uh, there's no need for imminent action, we can put it aside. And it allows us to focus on the right substances and work on the most impactful substances first. Okay, so the right substances to focus on are the ones that are most impactful? The most impactful and the ones that seem to have the, the, the hazards that we're looking at. So it's, it's a screening work, like I said, and uh, we try to put chemicals on a path. And we're trying to be very transparent about that too. So we've been publishing all our reports on the website and explaining the uncertainties attached because there can be various levels of uncertainty with those assessments because it's based on the data for the group. So, Is that transparency helpful for industry? I think for sure it's very helpful because of course we want to avoid regrettable substitution and um, we also have seen that uh, this is helps us to, uh, to drive our developments. Huh? In our company uh, we do a lot of developments and of course we look at the guidance and what happens uh, in the assessments to, to make the right choices for the future. So I think this is really important. On the other hand of course the grouping based on the uh, hazard classifications the risks uh, has to be also lean on what's already there in the list. Huh? So to, to on the reach candidate list to be more um, predictable huh? because this is the whole thing huh? when we look about new developments we have to predict uh, what are the good chemicals for the future and uh, the more is done on the grouping part the more guidance we get but of course um, we are in the line to develop chemicals and we have to find the right ones. So I think there the transparency and the guidance on both sides is very important. We saw also grouping in harmonization uh, for harmonization purposes. Will this lead, Paul, to a kind of harmonized haven? We're, we're moving in that. I mean, like I said earlier, we've been doing a lot of work in the past few years on, on grouping for prioritization. Now, after those few years have passed, we start to see that substances arrive at the doorstep of the various processes. And we see a role for groups in classification and labeling, harmonized classification and labeling, as we do in all the other processes. There's a bit to figure out still in terms of how we do that exactly because we've used, like you said, we've been used to using the one by one substance by substance approach. So it's a, it's a learning exercise, but we think as long as we maintain some coherence in the group and don't get too diverse in terms of hazards, we can, we can have a good process and an efficient uh, classification and labeling process also. Okay, but from a hazard you go to risk management also, eh? and grouping uh, in relation to risk management, eh? is that difficult? Because in groups sometimes the substances have yeah, quite a variety of hazard and risk profiles and that could, I think, lead to a challenging assessment. So are there, is there an option to define conditions or criteria for grouping approach in relation to risk management then? I think we always look, you know, we start with a group and there can be subgroups within that group. So if you see something that's very diverse in terms of the hazard profile or the use profile, maybe it doesn't make perfect sense to, to keep that group intact. But there could still be value in moving them through in parallel. So there might be some synergies in you know, one, one subgroup within a larger group and, and another one. So we try to keep things together as much as we can, but there are, like you explained, sometimes complications which mean things have to go their separate paths through the different uh, regulatory processes. Can you give an example of a big group and subgroup within? Uh, one we just published recently is the orthothalates, which is of a quite a topical one, I think. Um, and within that, there's four or five different subgroups for, for various reasons. So it's explained always in our, in our reports that when we do subgrouping, the group itself might have a name and stay the, you know, in the report as is, because that's how it started. But things go on, on slightly different paths as we de develop and, and move through the process. Like branches of a tree, basically. Exactly. But like okay. I said, there can be value in keeping them in parallel, at least, so we don't have duplicate uh, discussions. Hey, in the restriction process, the generic approach to risk management enables uh, for CMR substances to restrict substances without the opinions of RAC and SEAC. Uh, an extension of the generic approach to risk management is expected. So more groups can then enter the restriction reserve. Is this a logical direction? I think it is. I mean, the, the goals that we see in the, in the Commission's chemical strategy uh, for sustainability are they need pragmatism and we need approaches like this. We've had some success in the past with the uh, generic restriction on CMR category one in, in consumer uses, which 
protects consumers from, from those chemicals and we think it's logical to try and uh, expand that approach. Now having said that, obviously the Commission is looking at this in the REACH review and they'll do an impact assessment to look at the pros and cons, but uh, we support the idea and we've used it successfully in the past. Clarine, substances are normally grouped on the basis of their structural similarity, but for regulatory purposes not grouped on the basis of their uses for exposure routes and pathways. However, with, for example, the tattoo ink example, eh, we see more grouping in other directions. What is your view on this? Yeah, I see that uh, purely on structure, grouping uh, is limited, of course, because just your family, uh, it doesn't mean you are also have the same hazard profile. So that's a limited uh, thing on the structural base. Going in the direction of the users gives a better perspective and really helps to, uh, to define this. So I see, my feeling is that it goes more in that direction than the structural part. So that when we discuss to define broad groups based on structural um, assessments, that when you look deeper into those groups, you will more define them and look into the uses and the real hazards, which then come from. And this is also why we need the transparency, because when we look in, the, um, in our developments, we look, of course, first at the structures, but then we see different results for the um, toxicological testing, the ecotox, and we need to understand this to take the right decisions. So yes, I see that it will go in the direction of the more uh, hazard approach grouping, and I also feel that this will be um, yeah, the benefit for those ones which don't fall then in the group and structurally similar. Okay. Hey, Paul already mentioned the REIT revision. Um, one of the chapters is about polymers. Um, you know a lot about polymers. Would a grouping approach be useful for polymers as well? Yeah, of course, we follow the uh, definition for the polymer REACH and uh, we are reading all the uh, things done and defined. But we also see that it all falls with the, with the identity of the polymer. So I think this is key. And when we talk about digitization, uh, if we talk about polymer, it's a much broader group than substances. So um, to be efficient, you need a clear identity of the polymers to demonstrate the sameness. And also to come to the effective grouping, you need a digitization. I think this is what we really need for the future. And there needs to, a lot to be done no, for this part and to be defined. But I think basically on what we define today to look at a set of basic fish chemical information and defining clear identities is the first little step. To end with a positive note, what are the positive effects of grouping for society? And I think grouping is quite important uh, to be more effective and efficient and uh, gain also a lot of time. But of course, uh, when we do this, we also have to be very transparent and guide uh, industry with it to come uh, with the right chemistry for the future. And I think this is really a process we have to, um, to do now because we also need chemistry uh, yeah, for the climate change, that's very clear. So uh, to do this in the right way, um, I think the grouping will be a very effective tool for that. Okay, and Paul, what is your positive note at the end? Sure, yeah, I think, I mean, looking at these groups holistically, you know, at the chemical universe, as we call it, has allowed us to really pick out, you know, like I said earlier, the most impactful things and work on the right substances at the right time, uh, which helps with substitution, for example, but also ultimately delivers on the goals that we have to protect human health and the environment. Wonderful. Karin and Paul, I'm really happy that you're part of our ChemCon family, a unique group of its own, I would say. Uh, thank you for your perspectives and the various directions of grouping. And uh, time will tell if we keep enjoying the Pied Piper's tune or if we realize that the Pied Piper practice has changed our tune.